This is IVP. This is The Disruptors, a podcast from InterVarsity Press about how faith is changing culture in unexpected ways. I'm Nancy Wong Yoon. I'm a sociologist, a pop culture expert, and a professor at Biola University. New eyes that look at the world in new ways. New eyes make contact blue, green, and gray. New eyes I realized I never knew when you realize feelings you trapped inside of you. New eyes that see the respect you earn. And I am a friend of G. Hi, G. Ahoy there, matey. <laughs> Are you a pirate today, G? <laughs> today I am a pirate, yeah. <laughs> Because we're so Although, excited to talk to Phil and Jeff. <laughs> Phil and Jeff. Um, I've known Phil and Jeff, gosh, for a long time. I, I mean, I knew Jeff, I knew Phil, um, angry Asian man. I think, you know, he was infamous um, from his blog. And I remember the first time I met him was in an elevator at the San Diego Asian Film Festival. He probably, I'm sure he doesn't remember, but I remember recognizing him and thinking, oh, it's Angry Asian That's Man. The angry Asian Man. <laughs> yes. And I said, hi, I'm such a big fan. He was so gracious. I didn't know he was Christian. I, yeah. I just remember he was extremely gracious and very kind. And, and he's been that way, you know, ever since. And, and I did not know that Jeff was Asian until I asked Phil, like, I, I was like, hey, you want to come on? And do you want to bring Jeff to this a Christian podcast? What do you think? Is he you know <laughs> and, then, and then Phil was like oh yeah yeah just just Christian yeah I was oh. like oh <laughs> I think he said you th- you didn't know Jeff was Asian <laughs> I'm like really <laughs> you didn't know Jeff Yang was Asian <laughs> but you meant you didn't no. know he was Christian <laughs> right right yeah he may or may not be Asian but <laughs> you know I, I don't want to assume <laughs> but he's Christian for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it was it was cool to be able to talk about I think faith for the first time uh, with the two of them. Even though I knew um, later on that Phil is Christian, although it was not because I I talked about it with him. It was like you know here through the Asian American Christian grapevine, like who's Asian and who's not. Um, although in this in this whole you entire podcast to the newsletter. <laughs> It's like an underground whisper gallery. Like, did exactly. you know that Phil Yu is Christian? Um, yeah. And he's but... not that angry in person. <laughs> he isn't. He really isn't. He's really mild mannered. So yeah. anyway, so <laughs> let's take a listen. I am thrilled to be speaking to Jeff Yang and Phil Yu, whom I consider the godfathers of contemporary Asian American culture. Jeff started A Magazine in 1989. It is the first East Asian focused magazine that I ever subscribed to. He is a CNN opinion columnist. He's also father of two boys, Sky and Hudson. And Hudson Yang was the star of the hit ABC sitcom Fresh Off the Boat. Phil Yu really needs no introduction. He is a professional, quote, angry Asian man which is the name of the longest running, most widely read independent blog devoted to Asian American news, culture, and commentary. And they together host a podcast named They Call Us Bruce. And I've been on a couple of times and it's a fun podcast. And they have co-written along with Philip Wang, a new book coming out in March, 2022 called Rise, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s till now. Welcome Phil and Jeff to The Disruptors. Woo! Hey. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jeff, in your new book, Rise, you wrote that you were born in 1968, the same year as Asian America itself. Can you say more about what that means? 1968 was a, a unique year in that uh, it was the first year in which the term Asian American was used publicly as a self-identification term by a group of pan-racial, pan-cultural Asians, right? And when I say it's kind of the the birth year of Asian America, it really means it's the beginning of Asian Americans coalescing and collaborating as a group across ethnicities. Uh, and that particular event, the, the movement that sort of spawned the Asian American movement, uh, was something that took place in the Bay Area. Uh, it was obviously the 60s, a time of uh, great change, uh, people rising up to try to demand justice against the establishment. And amongst 
that group in that area, in the Bay Area, you had uh, student activists uh, who essentially wanted to march in coalition with black, uh, Latinx, and native protesters demanding essentially equity for people from what they then call the third world. The problem, of course, was that there literally wasn't a banner they could march under, right? Uh, there was going to be a, a big protest actually in support of Huey Newton, uh, leader of the Black Panthers, who had been jailed for allegedly uh, killing a police officer. Uh, and they had to come up with something to organize around. So after some deliberation, um, they they chose the term Asian American, and that was kind of in homage to an emulation of Afro American uh, identity, the Afro American movement, which was existing at the time. So that banner literally was the first time people saw that in public. That that term, Asian American, and it took off like wildfire. Like literally after. That march, that moment, we started to see the term Asian American being adopted in academia, in government, and then more broadly in culture. And it, part of the reason why it's important to me is not just because it was the beginning of the, the term that I've really embraced as my identity all my life, but it's also more or less been the term that I've had to contend with all my life, right? Because people born in the late 60s, well, we were the first generation, the first wave of Asians in America who had to kind of explain what it means to be Asian American, to, to fill in the blank, if you will, of what Asian American means. So, Phil, so you started Angry Asian Man in 2001. So this was before Facebook, before Twitter. And 2001 was also the year that the 9-11 attacks happened on the Twin Towers. And you write in Rise about how that tragedy became a test of our resolve as Asian Americans and what we stood for as a community. What did you mean by that? I think, uh, you know, Angry Asian Man, the blog, tracks my own, even my own evolution as an Asian American and my identity and my embrace of my community. I think I didn't come into this fully formed, right? So the fact that it started in 2001, I was like, still, I feel like still a, um, a, a, a baby Asian American, I think, uh, in terms of my political consciousness, because um, a lot of that happened in in college is where, you know, it was really sparked and that identity formation really started to coalesce and become something. But right after college, which is the era we're talking about, 2001, is the time where you kind of face this idea, this challenge You're like well what is that what do you want Asian, being asian american to mean outside of the sort of ethnic studies bubble of of college right um and so as i was kind of grappling with that it was all kind of being um turned over and and dissected as i was writing this blog so when something as cataclysmic as 9-11 the 9-11 attacks happens um you know we saw members of the Asian American community, the Muslim American communities, like being attacked. I mean, like scapegoated. Um, and uh, that's when you, you kind of like, you kind of start thinking about like, well, what does Asian American mean? Asian American as an inclusive label, it includes members of this community that is be that is, be that are being attacked. Right. And so I, I kind of had to kind of revise and, 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 kind of go over and understand that like our community is much more expansive than just people who have this face, right? People who are, um, and sort of our popular understanding of what Asian is, is, you know, let's face it, it's largely East Asian, right? It's East Asian centric, but we have to challenge that and continue to sort of speak up and uh, not let ourselves be complacent about that identity, but, but challenge people and say like it, also includes brown folks, includes South Asians, it includes you know Muslims, and so um, 9/11, of course, was just the time where that was truly being tested. And uh, I kind of made up my mind then that like um, this blog and the stuff that I talk about would also cover um, South Asian communities and um, and make sure people understood that you know like and not be and I didn't have to be explicit about that, but just by the things that I wrote about. 
people would see that my my definition of Asian American was um, a little more was a little different than um, I think maybe traditional understandings of of Asian. I think Jeff, you experienced racism growing up in Staten Island in New York City, and you wrote in the same essay about it happening specifically on Halloween with your sister. Would you share <laughs> with our listeners what happened? The book is uh, a look at Asian America's emergence. Right, it's called Rise. Uh, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s till now. And we basically took the three decades from the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, each of us uh, with kind of our own decade separated you know, a little bit less than 10 years in some cases uh, amongst ourselves. But we, we talked about the decades in which we came of age as Asian Americans, really. Uh, and we looked at the larger 30 years or so in which this was happening as a time of, of really great importance to the shaping of Asian America's presence in the public eye, especially, right? This was the time when uh, we, we essentially took the reins of telling our own stories and framing our own narrative and making parts of ourselves that had been overlooked uh, or actively suppressed visible to the naked eye of America, if you will. So one of the things we really decided amongst ourselves is we didn't just want to tell this through the lens of popular culture as we ordinarily define it, that is to say film and television and, and music and literature. We also wanted to, to talk about the popular culture that we lived, right? The, the lived experiences that became a part of this kind of infrastructure of of memes and uh, and and cross communication uh, between people from different ethnicities, all, almost all of us remember that the forging ground of kind of coming out as Asian American occurred in college, right? And the ways in which we of different ethnic backgrounds and even in many cases uh, very different uh, heritages in terms of the kinds of geographies and. Uh, and communities in America we lived in, the things that we actually shared, the things that actually gave us commonality enough to start feeling like we were part of one very, very diverse community were these shared experiences that cut across our, our ethnic spaces. And so we created what we call spaces, right? These are the parts of our, our lives literally unfolded for people that we shared in various ways as Asian Americans, but also being careful to elaborate some of the differences as well. And, and one of them is faith. Halloween is, is a fraught holiday. <laughs> I think we've all seen this. Uh, it's a time when anybody can adopt anything as kind of a second skin. And uh, very often people do, in fact, actually adopt other people's skins. That's a whole nother problem. But in my case, as a child of Taiwanese immigrants, my parents did not subscribe to the idea that Halloween was a holiday, right? We grew up in a, a very uh, tight-knit community of faith, and they saw Halloween as, as sort of like vaguely de devil worship adjacent. <laughs> uh, but also it meant spending money on doing kind of dumb stuff, like buying clothes you were never going to wear again and giving free stuff to random kids who were threatening you with, you know, uh, basically assault and battery or, or uh, <laughs> vandalism. We'd never been allowed to go outside for Halloween. We, we were just forced to sit inside uh, with the front lights off so people would know not to you know, in any way, bug the one Asian family in <laughs> this very, very white, very uh, kind of Italian American neighborhood of, of Staten Island, and I, I got to have an age where it just felt so painful and uh, oppressive that my friends got to go out and and do trick or treating, and I wasn't allowed to. I finally demanded to my parents that we be allowed to, but they wouldn't buy us costumes or anything. So we ended up going out for our first trick or treat. Me and my uh, younger sisters, two years younger, in our Chinese school cultural f outfits, right? Which meant uh, I was wearing a Kung Fu outfit, you know, basically t-shirt, you know, black drawstring pants and, uh, you know, those typical martial arts ru rubber sole shoes. And my, my sister was wearing a, a Chinese schoolgirl 
you know, kind of pajamas type outfit with ribbons in her hair because she did Chinese dance. And so we walk outside into the jungle of Staten Island uh, and we're almost immediately accosted by this large group of roving teens carrying, uh, you know, weapons of minor mass destruction. And they started interrogating us and laughing at us for, first of all, wearing quaint native outfit. And secondly, for, you know, just basically being Asian. <laughs> and uh, the questions of like, you know, where we came from, what we were wearing, you know, why we, were, we looked like such idiots, etc. It was the first time I, I really had that kind of where are you from type interrogation, right? Uh, and not the last, certainly. It was also the first time that I was subjected to kind of an avalanche of rotten eggs <laughs> and other kinds of throwing of relatively non-lethal but certainly disgusting stuff in our direction as part of a larger, you know, kind of conversation about us being uh, unwelcome outsiders. So we ran home covered with goo and muck and took showers. And then basically our parents never let us go out again until uh, I was old enough to drive. <laughs> it was it was uh, my first real experience with our neighborhood, which had always been a little bit weird to me. I mean, you know, I had friends, certainly. But uh, the neighborhood itself always felt like a... Uh, a bit of a forbidding place and uh, an exotic culture for me and, and my sister. We were really the, the first non-white people to live on this long block, this long, this large sort of multi-block area, which was very, very much kind of an ethnic white upper middle class uh, part of Staten Island. And, you know, people, people would like drive past us in their Camaro IROC Zs and, and sort of like, you know, make ching chong noises and stuff like that. The playground was, was a, a dangerous place, uh, where I was constantly being uh, demanded to show off my martial arts skills, etc. But this was the first time that the, really, I was just being interrogated with that bank of questions that, uh, come with being Asian, right? The, and with the term Asian. You mentioned, um, being part of a tight knit church community. So I'm assuming that those boys that threw eggs at you were not part of that community or or was it an <laughs> ethnic church? What was that? Yeah, no, we, we actually grew up in, in a Taiwanese American church, uh, an immigrant church. I guess you could say it began as a, uh, a fosterage of a, uh, an existing church. We were part we were, uh, reform, right? Bas Presbyterian, basically. Uh, but there were, the gymnasium, essentially, that we uh, uh, had our, our services in uh, when I was very young was attached to a, a Baptist congregation. And early on, you know, typically there were kind of the Chinese language service, the Taiwanese language services, actually. Uh, they had Taiwanese and Mandarin, but those, you know, the Taiwanese and, and Mandarin services were held in the gymnasium. And the kids, because they didn't have enough people to teach Sunday school, uh, and we all basically spoke English, we all just ended up being ushered into the main white church, right? But then after a lot of hustle uh, and, and fundraising by the congregation, my, my dad being one of the... Uh, the eldest elders, if you will, of the, that congregation, they managed to raise the funds to break ground and build their own church. So from about um, like late elementary school, early middle school uh, onwards, we, we started going to church in a freestanding building that was just for us, right? And so that nucleus of a Taiwanese American community which was flung out all across Staten Island and even into Brooklyn, would gather together at that one church. So we all lived in places where there weren't a lot of other Asians around us, but we made community through the gathering around this congregation. And uh, and that's actually much of my experience uh, as an Asian in America, as a Taiwanese American, certainly uh, growing up. It was, it was very much a situation where faith was the lens for uh, cultural community as well. We are talking about Asian American, kind of the beginnings of, but also I think Asian American churches are very much a part of that. Even in the book, actually, 
Uh, I think there's a hilarious um, section that's kind of got these, you know, these drawings and it's about Asian American faith. Um, And then there's, I think, a a focus on the Asian American church. And there's like little kind of like diagrams of what kind of people go to Asian American church. And and one of them was like the pastor, senior (laughs) and Asian from the old country. I love the whole translator who's doubling the length of the sermon by repeating every line in English. (laughs) Kids making paper airplanes or origami out of the service program. Um, so and and especially like thug uncle actually very devout. I don't know why that really. <laughs> I didn't actually grow, see. I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up in the Asian American church. So all of this is actually really interesting to me, both culturally and faith wise. So tell me about about how you came up with these kind of um, you know archetypes of of the immigrant church and, and your also your own experiences growing up in that church. We we took a look at. Uh, the ways in which growing up within faith communities as Asian Americans looks similar and different across people who grew up in Buddhist temples versus Christian churches or mosques uh, or Hindu temples, right? And there are really certain things that when we're talking to our friends about this, we remember as being similar, right? Because ultimately, these are all uh, forging grounds, again, not just for a sense of uh, personal connection to, uh, you know, to the transcendent, to the holy, but also to one another, to a set of peers and into a community. And things like that thug uncle, <laughs> the guy who who looks like he probably spends his weekends drinking, uh, and then Sunday morning puts on his best suit and shows up, at, you know, uh, and and sits in the front and and leads everybody, you know, in in rousing hymns and so forth. I mean, that's for, something for which... me. For me, that guy is the guy who was like the hardest Koreatown gangster in his youth, <laughs> and then now, but now, like he, you know, he left. All, now he's got like a wife and and he's got kids and a job and everything, and, and, and you know, and he goes to church every Sunday, right? It's hiding his tattoos, but you know, yeah. <laughs> showing yeah. showing his shine. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so Phil, you know, when we were kind of jamming around this with uh, our our larger community of people who contributed to the book. People were, were sharing lots of stuff that felt like uh, it was familiar, you know, regardless of what our faith is. And th- things like having the big communal meal after service, right? That was something that uh, whether you're Hindu or, or uh, Muslim or, you know, Christian of various denominations, for whatever reason, Asian Americans share food as and break bread as part of our services, right? So th- that's the kind of thing which we tried to home in on. I mean, the the... the... The way the book was kind of conceived in in a lot of ways was these conversations where like, you know, I grew up in I grew up in the Korean church, right? A Korean American church. Uh, my parents have gone to the same Korean church for over forty years. Which anybody who <laughs> you ask anyone who's in a Korean church, nobody stays in a, in a Korean church that long because it eventually splits or there's some disagreement and you know other churches form. But my parents have been the same one for four decades. Um, but I grew up at this one. And then, but if you talk to kids who grew up in also Korean church, no matter where you were, there's all, you, you, you grow up and then you compare stories about how you grew up in that church. And they're always kind of, you find commonality no matter where you're from, you know? And, um, and so this book, actually, we wanted to kind of capture that like idea of like, oh, you, you, that was the thing for you too, you know? And we wanted to kind of, capture that in the book and so my hope is that when people read it and read the things like the spaces there is a sense of recognition from people like oh that was this is so true to me as well you know and um and and, and finding commonality and and community in that you know so something like the 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 faith the faith um spread the spaces spread you know that that also comes from i of just like asking other people like a lot of these things come from asking other people like hey what, what was it like growing up at a church like and then what if you wanted to describe it like people would and then everyone would just throw in all this stuff and um a lot of the stuff was really written by committee because we were this is all stuff that's like oh yeah me too me too you know so i kind of hope that people will see that will, will kind of recognize that you know yeah, I um I think of myself actually as being saved, quote unquote, quote saved by um Asian American Christians, right? Because I didn't grow up in an immigrant church, but I I the first church that I mm. started going to was a Korean immigrant church where 
<laughs> where I had to learn Korean mm. hymns phonetically because I didn't, and I figured out Yesu, <laughs> but I figured out Saran, <laughs> which is love, and we would do these movements, and I would I would sing, and I remember my Sunday school teacher um, saying. Uh, scolding the other kids, so I didn't have a lot of friends because <laughs> I just I just went as a I, was, I think I was probably twelve or thirteen. I just went by myself, and uh, he, they was he would scold the other people. They'd, he'd be like, "You're not paying attention. Look at Nancy. She's not even Korean. And she's like singing and <laughs> paying attention." <laughs> and of course, that just oh, no. made all the kids hate me even more. <laughs> But I didn't have parents that went there. So I was, besides my Sunday school teacher, I was ignored by the pastors. I was completely like, it was such a, a unique experience going to a Korean immigrant church as a as a young Taiwanese American um, immigrant who, you know, because the Koreans had all the, all the churches where I was. They were, um, you know, in Southern California, all my friends are Korean. It was my Korean friends that invited me, right? They were the ones that introduced me to Christianity. So... But um, mm. but yeah, but the double the the double service right there's like or multiple services right there's the the Korean language service and then there's the Korean American mm. uh, youth pastor and and having those kind of and then like you said Phil about the kind of splitting because eventually I think the the second third generations maybe move on to multicultural churches even white churches right is, is that you guys' experience. I think the the uh, tendency to come together and then the tendency to eventually kind of get into fights and break apart <laughs> is something which we see a lot of in immigrant organizations in general, not just because of generational splits, but because, you know, uh, I think immigrants, when they first arrive, they, they cluster out of need, out of survival instinct and desire to share resources to build a foundation, especially, I think, as they're creating families. You know, you, you need, uh, like the first thing that, that uh, a lot of immigrants do when they arrive in America, and this is not just Asians, but, you know, a- across the board, is uh, they will build some sort of uh, faith institution, however they can, just to create, again, a, a gravitational center for their community. And then from there, that entity becomes a combination of not just church, but community hall, you know, a social gathering place, um, educational facility. You know, you have child care or Saturday school, you know, for those of us who, who grew up on Saturdays learning language and culture and then eventually getting pelted with rotten eggs for it <laughs> on Halloween. Um, the, the church, the church again, in our case, served as this uh, almost like an injection of what they wanted to cultivate as, as a, a normal environment for being, you know, Taiwanese American. In in my case, in in a very uh, a very white, very very ethnic uh, white community, right? At the beginning, this is all great. You bring all these people together, you share resources to build these this sort of basic architecture of a community. But at some point, people have egos and people have different agendas. And uh, at, the church gets large enough such that the congregation also kind of develops factions. And then somebody's like, you know, thanks, peace and out. I'm going to build my own church over here. <laughs> <laughs> and and that happens, and so you have you have this proliferation, this diaspora of uh, sub communities within the community that that foster their own. It's it's kind of like Asian immigrant church planting is is really about getting into big fights and then like sp- splitting. <laughs> I, I'm being kind of very, very rude about that. But that is what happened certainly in the community in Staten Island, where uh, this one main Taiwanese American church. If effectively accidentally fostered a bunch of new ones because people would go off and start their own congregations and begin the whole process all over again. So it's certainly a big part of, of, of my experience in some ways, like being a part of this mothership church and then being told that the reason why a bunch of my friends no longer attended was because, let's not talk about it, but you know they thought very differently about this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and went off to create their own thing. How about you, I, I think for me, um, my parents, my my parents uh, joining their church way back in the early '80s when they first got to California. You know, it was largely for the reasons Jeff stated: was finding community, commonality with other Korean Americans, other Koreans, Korean immigrants. You know, because 
this is where they could connect with other people from the old country in language, you know, and then us kids were sort of dragged along. So we had to grow up in this community, not really by, you know, by any choice of ours, but, and so we were shuffled into sort of the youth group and the, and then the burgeoning English language ministry at our church. And again, because I, that's where we had to go on Sundays, you know what I mean? That, that was it. I think for me, my, my sort of my journey of embracing my faith, not because I was forced to, but by choice, really, it did also came in college. I joined my college's inner varsity chapter, but the Asian American, the Asian American chapter of inner varsity, that's where now given the choice of whether or not I wanted to participate in this relationship with Jesus Christ, like I was, I was kind of by choice wanting to join this community of, of folks. And that's where I found like some of my closest friends and really made connection, you know, and, um, and I find that my journey as an Asian American and embracing that as a political identity, it kind of parallels the, also sort of my journey of faith as well, right? It's, it's, at the same time is all kind of happening. And this is where my, these communities intersect, right? This Asian American, uh, Asian American Christian ministry on campus is where, where I kind of found that intersection of that community and was really able to grow. And so in a weird way, I mean, I also believe like no one is by default Asian American. You have to make that choice as a political identity, as something that you want to embrace. Like I am Asian American, right? Because most people, nobody in Asia considers themselves Asian, right? They consider themselves Korean or Chinese, Indian, there's not a lot of unity between those groups either. It's like a lot of people kind of hate each other, right? So it's not till we come here that we're shuffled into this banner blanket term of Asian American. And so I believe like you have to kind of make that choice. So like I, I want to engage and be an Asian American and whatever things that that means. And I also feel like, you know, like when we talk about our, our faith, like you have to make that choice to follow Jesus, right? Like that is a, that is a, uh, but the, the, being dragged on Sundays doesn't count, you know, so uh, you have to make that volunteer, you have to make that choice. And so there is kind of a parallel be- in, with my journey and, and how it kind of collides. I do think that there's a similar profession, you know, a profession of a kind of faith that you have to make in both contexts, right? To your point, Phil, it's, it is something where uh, being Asian American isn't just something that doesn't come organically. It, it is something you kind of have to work at. Because there's so many reasons to not think about what it means to be Asian American, except under duress, except under circumstances where you have a crisis going on. We, you know, Phil talked about 9/11, but more recently during the pandemic, all of a sudden everybody's like, "Stop API hate, stop Asian hate, etc." Well, you know, a lot of the people who were talking about it in this moment, where our vulnerable elders and our immigrant communities were being hit with this wave of bigotry, they weren't talking about it when we were, uh, you know, if you will, during peacetime, right? Um, And it's fortunate that there was an infrastructure of community organizations and leaders who were ready to step forward and provide a rubric and a scaffolding for people to, to form these um, these communities of need around, right? And I, I think, to Phil's point, it's not dissimilar, I think, uh, with, with Asian American churches and uh, kind of more broadly religious communities, communities of faith, right? They're always there, um, but there are these moments in which they become critical, just uh, forefronted parts of our our lives, our identities, and our political and social worlds. You, you think of things like uh, disasters that have occurred, you know, like, for instance, the L.A. riots, right, where Koreatown was in flames. A lot of the people who came together to really provide shelter and comfort and then ultimately to rebuild came out of institutions that were organized by faith leaders, or came out of churches, both in and outside of Koreatown. And that's, I think, something you see in 
most communities and certainly most immigrant communities or communities of color, right? Because it's, it's true for black churches as well, where the church ends up becoming this pillar of the community, right? But I think one of the things we learn really rapidly uh, as people of faith is that unless you keep on feeding that, uh, those institutions and, and even our own individual uh, belief, our own sense of, of uh, connection to those institutions, then they can be weakened. And you, you lose that ability to rely on them in times of crisis. So you have to always be working on that front. It's the same is true for Asian American community and identity as well. If we're not constantly engaging with it and reminding ourselves that there is this larger dialogue that he has to keep on happening, then to some degree, it's, it won't necessarily be there when we do need it, right? This, these institutions, these ideas, and, and that's a, a large part why we decided to write Rise, because over the course of this pandemic, we came from a situation in which just a couple of years before, we were all celebrating the arrival of Asian America on the public scene, it's crazy rich Asians, fresh off the boat, all these you know successes were happening. And then literally 18 months later, people were calling us, you know, plague dogs, infected vermin, <laughs> trying to like cast us out of, of uh, society. And it felt like everything was going to be swept away so we, we wrote Rise in some part as a uh, an archive of all the things that, that led to the moment of what felt like triumph, right? Uh, not just so we could remember it, but if necessary, so we could rebuild it. Because if there was a situation in which we weren't able to connect, meet face-to-face, uh, engage in all of this, if you will, congregation building, right, uh, within the context of being Asian American, well, we needed something else to, to fall back on if and when the pandemic finally was over and we could we could pick up the pieces and find our, our way back to the path. And so, yeah, you know, we, we, we put 30 years and much longer than that, the history behind it, into a big box as kind of like a hope chest for what happened after COVID. I mean, I feel like a lot of times our faith, um, because the kind of like, I feel like I had an Asian American faith because of my introduction, but then as I kind of uh, dig into what faith is, what Christianity is, it often feels like, okay, well, it feels like the culture of the the kind of teachings isn't necessarily always intersecting, right? We're talking about kind of church life as Asian American, but then what about like, how do we kind of take a faith that has been steeped in kind of Western traditions and even Western centeredness? How do we kind of embrace that faith as Asian Americans? I think it's a great question because when you look at the and speaking here about Christianity and uh, the institutions within Christianity, there is such a divide, I think, between the way that evangelical Christianity is represented in our political conversation today and the reality of, of how it's lived by many Asian Americans, uh, both second generation, third generation, and even first generation, Right. Uh, evangelical Christ- Christianity, you know, fundamentalist Christianity, right? Um, it is uh, broadly seen as kind of a white conservative movement, uh, something that is extremely politicized in ways which I think many Asian American Christians don't identify with, right? It's, it's focused on things like um, social, you know, social political change, like uh, Ending abortion and uh, and and you know even alignment with a lot of nationalist politics in America that Asian Americans may find a little bit uncomfortable since we've in many cases uh, our parents and, and grandparents came from countries where the, that kind of nationalist fervor often led to very very dangerous and and uh, violent outcomes right. So you, you have a situation where uh, I think especially as second generation people, professing faith means something to us, which is about family, which is about community, which is about culture, 
But then when you bring it out into the public sphere, it's saying that you are an, you know, from an evangelical Christian background sounds like you voted for Trump, right? And that's a, that's a big divide, I think, for a lot of Asian Americans. I think what I, I'm seeing is that, especially second, third generation, et cetera, younger Asian American Christians, people who have gone through, uh, especially um, communities of faith as young adults in college and as young professionals, there's a, a very strong desire to redefine and rethink what it means to be Christian in the context of, of being people of color, to, to build uh, a, a different kind of Christian identity in the public sphere. And, and we see this because, you know, those of us who have grown up in churches, who are fortunate enough in, in many ways to, to do so, we don't, when we graduate from school, necessarily go back to those churches. We find other congregations that very often, I think Phil mentioned this, are multiracial, multiethnic, uh, and integrated into our, our lives as adults. And that means things like, well, you know, when I was in, in New York uh, after college, I went to Redeemer for, uh, for a decade and a decade and change, right? Uh, and then I, you know, I went to a Redeemer church plan. Well, for those of you who know, who know Redeemer, Redeemer is this gigantic church uh, in New York, very, very popular among uh, young professionals, but about 60, 70% of that con congregation is Asian American and second generation Asian American. And so by default, it's not an Asian American church, but it, be it kind of became or becomes an Asian American church as a result. And so that rethinking of what it means to be part of an Asian American body within the church, I, I think by definition, it, it forces us to uh, negotiate some of these more uncomfortable lines of, of what it means to be Asian American as well, uh, and Asian American Christian in particular. I, I'm going to be honest, like, you know, in the last decade, half decade, decade, like, it has been extremely hard for me to, it's been a struggle, really, with my own faith to align with what we associate with sort of mainstream evangelical Christianity, you know what I mean? Like the, a large, the large vocal um, embrace of Trump um, by evangelicals was like a really hard thing to, to swallow and reconcile. And I was just like, I, I, I don't, it it's, it's been a, a very personal difficult kind of wrestling that I've had to do with like, do I want, do I even want to associate myself with anything having to do with this? You know, it's, it's, that's been very hard. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I have found, I, I've always kind of found is that like, you know, sort of the, our, our most mainstream kind of, um, understanding of like, um, Western Christianity, as it exists now, it is, it is still very white. And it seems like when Asian Americans participate and are part of community, our identities tend to get a little bit flattened in that, right? So I have struggled to find my, what is my place in this, you know, as an Asian American? Like, and where do I find community where, like, my Asian American identity as a Christian is validated and, like, you know, and, and is seen as something that, you know, that God made me and is valuable and not just something that has to fit into this other larger puzzle, you know? And so that's a constant conversation and thing that I'm turning over my head. Like, um, it's a struggle, man. It's just, it really is a struggle. And so, um, if I'm being honest, there are parts of me that is just kind of like, let myself become numb to a lot of the, the conversations around, around, um, my faith and faith in general, just, because it's it's hard. It's it's and it's easier not to engage sometimes, honestly. Well, it's been kind of co opted, I think, right? Um, and that's that's the problem. Um, Jeff, you were going to say. Yeah, I, actually, I think probably I, I should say this because uh, when I moved to LA and and I, I moved out here with uh, Hudson, my my elder son, because <laughs> because his career took us out here, right? Because he he got cast. <laughs> you know, out of nowhere in this ABC TV show, Fresh Off the Boat. And uh, when I landed here, I had friends 
but I didn't really have a community and I certainly didn't have a community of faith to lean into. And uh, one of the first people I connected with was Phil, right? Because of course, you know, he, he not only lived here, he lived uh, at the time he was uh, in West LA, which is uh, where I was going to be settling as well for uh, Hudson's professional purposes. He had to actually stay on the, the West side. And um, it was actually Phil who invited me to his congregation, to our congregation, right? Uh, the first time when we landed because, uh, you know, and we never really had talked about being Christian before, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because we had been friends because of Asian American, you know, uh, journalism and popular culture. Just being Asian American, you can say it like just being Asian American. You can, you're, yeah. your friends, it's like, hey, how do you know Jeff from being Asian American? You know, <laughs> Phil was attending and is attending uh, a a church that has a you know a very very multicultural congregation, and uh, at the time the pastor uh, who has since moved on to to other really incredible stuff, um, Pastor Adam, African American incredible, incredible minister to a very diverse flock. And uh, it, it felt like home instantly. It was the, f- the first time I think I'd, I'd really seen a congregation that was evenly, pretty much evenly divided between white, black, Asian, you know, etc. cetera. Um, and it was so essential to feeling like I had some kind of anchor here in this weird, you know, Los Angeles reality. Um, but not least because... It also allowed me to spend time with Phil, you know, face to face and in person and not just over kind of uh, across a podcast mic, you know. If I remember correctly, Jeff's first Sunday visiting uh, our church, he <laughs> Adam preached about the prison industrial complex. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I mean, he brought he brought fire that that week. And I was just like. I was like, wow, this is this is a good day to bring Jeff because I could tell Jeff was like impressed. Yeah, I was sold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I mean, Pastor Adam has been such a, an important part of uh, of our our faith community here in, in Los Angeles, even as he moved on. But he was he was so important to the community and identity that we ended up forming as a family here that. When I when I got remarried, actually, uh, he performed the ceremony. So, um, and Phil was, of course, one of my my grizzlemen. So there's there's a real sense in which these things come hand in hand. And and as much as we, I think, have um, have moments where we look at the world and how the world looks at us at us as Asian Americans and as Christians and as Asian American Christians, and wonder, does that image really reflect me? It's in these moments where we we find one another and find our, ourselves in the reflection uh, of our body of faith that I think have been defining ones for me, whether it was, you know, back as a, a kid growing up in a gymnasium, <laughs> uh, all the way through to being an adult and a father myself now, uh, finding a, a place where my, my kids can really uh, find their own journeys to, to faith. So... Uh, you know, it, it's it's been. I don't think I could talk about being Asian American really without talking about uh, the the communities of faith that have fed that identity and that have formed my community. I've known Phil and Jeff, the pop culture godfathers of Asian America, for a while now, even before I knew they were great brothers in the faith. And talking to them, it all makes sense. I am so grateful for their voices as they speak and write on racism, injustice, and the celebration of ethnic identity. And likewise, I am grateful to IVP and their long history of publishing the prophetic voices of authors who faithfully engage with issues of racial justice. If you haven't already made it a priority to include books on racial justice in your library, I want to challenge you to start now. Visit ivypress.com backslash racial justice and browse a wide selection of books such as Reading While Black by Issa McCauley, Unsettling Truths by Mark Charles and Soon Cha Ra, Rediscipling the White Church by David Swanson, and Healing Racial Trauma by Sheila Wise Rowe, just to name a few. Don't wait. Learn from the wisdom of these authors and join us in pursuing justice, wholeness, and racial righteousness. Visit ivypress.com backslash racial justice today and use the promo code DISRUPT to get 30% off plus free U.S. shipping on any book. That's ivypress.com backslash racial justice. 
So at the end of each podcast, I ask each participant to actually share a inspirational or disruptive something that they are watching, reading, listening to. So could you share with our listeners something that you think they would find really, you know, inspiring? Well, at the risk of sounding a little self-serving, I one of my other endeavors is running a podcast called All the Asians on Star Trek, which is um, in which I interview all the Asians on Star Trek. Um, but that's just to me. That's just me. I just wanted to say that like, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and one of the things that I've been really inspired by is in the most current iteration of Star Trek, uh, which um, it, it, you know Star Trek was always a very um, progressive show, and it broke a lot of boundaries even in its inception. Um, for the 60s, we look back now, there's a lot of it that is very regressive, but it is currently still trying to stretch itself, constantly pushing boundaries of um, of an inclusive view of the future, and that includes casting and sort of the kinds of people who are um, able to participate in the future in Starfleet. I'm constantly surprised by their the way they handle it, too. And so I'm going to say Star, Star Trek you know, 55 years later is still disrupting and um, and inspiring. I'm going to pivot maybe to something a little bit more personally disrupting in some ways. And, and that is, well, I'll, I'll lead with the book that I think has been really uh, personally, I think, uh, impactful and, and uh, you know, again, disruptive to the way that I'm, I'm thinking about things in the world. Um, and then I'll talk about why it's meaningful. So our, our friend... Uh, our mutual friend Kat Chow uh, wrote a memoir called Seeing Ghosts, which is about her confronting mortality, confronting loss, and remembering the passing of her mother uh, from cancer and all the ways in which her family and her extended family and the way that she was brought up as an Asian American uh, in a, a largely white environment intersected with this incredible personal tra tragedy that was occurring in her family. And uh, it's an incredible, beautiful book. But I was reading it because we brought her onto our podcast and it was at basically the time in which uh, I, I was dealing with taking care of my parents because they had gotten breakthrough COVID. And uh, this occurred right after my sister got breakthrough COVID. And she may have unlikely gotten it, in fact, because she's an urgent care uh, doctor who's seeing 30 to 40 probable cases of COVID a day, right? And even though everybody's vaccinated, when you're exposed that many times, well, the odds are bad, right? They're not in your favor. And so she got it. Uh, my niece got it. Uh, my parents got it. And my dad ended up in the hospital because he suffered a fall. And as soon as they actually uh, de detected them as positive. I'd been taking care of them at, at home, uh, in you know, them in quarantine, me wearing every form of PPP I could possibly do uh, out, out in New York City in Staten Island again. And um, he had to go to the, the hospital. He was put into isolation immediately because of COVID. And we didn't see him for weeks, you know, until he was, he was um, released. And that set a cycle in which he has been in and out of hospitals and rehab and that feeling of mortality, that feeling of, of fear of loss it was just so profound and continues to be, even as he's recovering, that uh, it, it just made me realize that we're all getting older and we all are going through phases in which we can never turn back. And that's true for ourselves individually. That's true for us as a country. That's true for us as an Asian American community. And so I, 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 that book, I think, really put that into context for me. This, this sense of realizing that we are surrounded by ghosts. Some of them are friendly and supportive, you know, memories of our past that we want to embrace and, and up, uplift, and others are haunting and, and deadly. More than anything else, I, I hope that we come out of this weird period in our, our lives not feeling haunted. Nancy, that was so fun to just listen to you guys talk about all things Asian American and even the overlap with 
being Christian as well. So this is the first time I've interviewed two people and it was challenging. <laughs> and even though I, it's challenging in so many ways because it was two people and I know them, I've known them for a while and they are podcasters. I've been on their podcast twice at events. I always see Phil like at every movie <laughs> premiere that I go to because we always see the same Asian American films. And um, and yeah, I really appreciate it. I think uh, both of them talked about, but I think Phil started the conversation about choosing to identify as Christian and choosing mm. the faith and then choosing to identify as Asian American, that both are kind of ongoing projects that one must continue to invest in mm. and be around other Asian Americans, other Christians to to keep up the faith, to keep up the the fight. And and I think that, that I don't think I've ever thought of both in parallel like that before. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask about your thoughts about that because I know you think a lot about culture and religion and how they overlap. How did how did that um, play into this interview? You know, I don't know if I think about that overlap as much as I should. <laughs> I think about it. Maybe I think you when embody I have... that overlap more than <laughs> yes. I, th- I analyze I think it to death. <laughs> questions of identity are hard because I think we are, you know, I'm, I just celebrated a birthday, I'm in my oh, 40s, yeah, and, and, and I still don't know what I want to be or what I want to yeah. do. And I, I do think of myself as Asian American Christian. Those are, I think, very uh, solid identities mm-hmm. that won't shift. But, mm-hmm. but whether it's my passion and my work or, you know, my other kind of uh, what I want to do in terms of service, all these things are kind of those identities are constantly shifting. Right. Yeah. And so I think that God can use our racial ethnic culture to bind us just as much as anything in the church. We can't separate racial ethnic identity from our Christian identities because, you know, what what's to say that things that we do in the church specific to the church isn't intersecting or just as vital as anything that we do in terms of mulchy making or eating (laughs) dumplings or, you know, or just going out for boba. Like all those things are ways of creating community. And isn't that what church is all about? We cover pop songs in a bottle, how we battle all the barriers, right? Some drink, some color their hair every night. Some try to stand out, some try to act white. Found music, but I've never been the stereo type. New eyes break old lies. New skin needs new wine. Thank you for listening to The Disruptors. The Disruptors is hosted by me, Nancy Wong Yoon. You can follow me at Nancy W Y U E N. Our theme song is New Eyes by Jason Chu. Our executive producers are Helen Lee and Andrew Bronson. Produced by Richard Clark, Cray Allred, and Myla Kim. <laughs>